Welcome to the National Security Digest for the week ending Friday, March 26, 2021. This podcast is brought to you by JINSA, the Jewish Institute for the National Security of America. Hi, I'm Ariel Davidson. But as we saw in recent conflicts, whether it's Israel or Azerbaijan or other places where drones are, are transforming warfare, these machines can do a lot of damage and they can make a lot of systems totally obsolete. They can do what the United States did to Saddam's army in 1991 when a massive Soviet-style conventional army was totally destroyed in 30 days. And drones can play a role in that. Coming up, we'll have the latest NetSec news and commentary. But first, we have an interview with Seth Fridsman of the Jerusalem Post. Seth Fransman is a senior Middle East correspondent and Middle East affairs analyst at the Jerusalem Post. In addition, he currently serves as the executive director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysis and as a Ginsburg Milstein Writing Fellow at the Middle East Forum. Seth is also a contributor to Defense News, The National Interest, and The Digest of Middle East Studies. He's also the author of the 2019 book, After ISIS, America, Iran, and the Struggle for the Middle East. Welcome, Seth. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so I asked you to come on to speak with us today because you've been giving some really sharp insight in the Jerusalem Post with regards to the latest escalation maneuvers by the Iranian regime. Uh, you know, I also wanted the chance to speak with you about your upcoming book, Drone Wars, which is actually scheduled for release in a few months. But, you know, first to the Iranian topic. So last week, there were a series of attacks were launched against U.S. bases in Iraq uh, Iran has denied the involvement, but as you noted in your reported recently, in your reporting recently, quote, this appears to be a systematic Iranian-backed campaign against the U.S. in Iraq. Like the attacks on Saudi Arabia from Yemen, Iran is trying to set the region alight. So I guess where I want to start is, could you give us a little bit of background about uh, Iran's recent targeting of U.S. bases in Iraq? In other words, this isn't really new, right? No, it's not new. I mean, it's interesting. So, you know, if we, I guess it's important to go back a little bit of history. Um, you know, Iran has a big role in Iraq. About half of Iraq is not only Shiites, but there are large numbers of uh, some Iraqis that fought alongside Iran against Saddam Hussein's regime, uh, completely understandably, of course, but they later became very close with the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. So, they basically became cadres of Iran or proxies, very similar to Hezbollah a bit. And after the U.S. invasion, although they were happy to see Saddam go, they then began to plot against the United States. And they killed, or Iran was involved or accused of you know, being involved of killing hundreds of Americans. Fast forward to, let's say, 2017 or 2016 and during the war on ISIS and you then have a lot of these pro-Iranian groups in Iraq who are not only political parties, but also have their own armed militias, which are similar, as I said, to Hezbollah. These groups are, not, are involved in fighting ISIS. And through fighting ISIS, they create an organization called the Hajj al-Shabi, or Popular Mobilization Units. And that's a kind of umbrella group of dozens of these militias. And those groups are then become an official paramilitary force. Similar, you could say, to the U.S. National Guard, but... Uh, a sectarian and pro-Iranian in nature. So those groups, once they were done fighting ISIS, basically vowed to begin to fight the Americans again. And so when you look at around 2017, one of the leaders of the groups goes to Lebanon and threatens Israel. 2018, they begin to say that the U.S. needs to leave Iraq. And 2019, they begin to up their attacks. And so throughout 2019, you have these rocket attacks on U.S. bases. And in those days, the U.S. was in Iraq helping Iraq fight ISIS. And they were training the Iraqis, training around 200,000 of them, by the way, as part of an international coalition. And all of a sudden, you have these rocket attacks on facilities where U.S. forces are located all throughout central Iraq. And in December, the first American contractor is killed. And, you know, it kind of steamrolls from there. We can go into some of the details. But basically... All the attacks are similar. They all use 107 millimeter rockets. Uh, it's a signature. It's a, it's a type of Iranian weapon. It's like if all of a sudden you had a bunch of mafia hits in New York City and they all use the same, uh, you know, 22 caliber rifle or something. You could say, oh, well, that's just, all we, that's just a pattern. So it's very clear what's going on. These groups are targeting Americans. 
they've killed several Americans. And then this year, with the Biden administration coming into office, they began to increase their attacks again. Uh, and they're they're harming mostly contractors. But of course, you know, in the end of the day, they'll eventually start killing Americans again. There aren't that many Americans in Iraq now because America has withdrawn from most of the bases there. So that's kind of the setup on the ground. Right. And we and it seems like a continuation of that pattern. You probably recall this, the protests outside the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Uh, what was it, about a year and a half ago now? And the way the media covered it, it seemed like there just wasn't enough information, at least in Western media, about how much uh, Iranian presence there is in Iraq right now. Uh, it's it's unseemly. And the influence that Iran has on Iraqi politics is really fascinating. I mean, we could go down a whole other rabbit hole at that. Um, but if you want to comment on that, I, I invite you to, because that in and of itself seems to be problematic. I think what's important to understand is that you know, Iran obviously works in the region mostly through Shiites. Uh, you know, it works in a sectarian way because the Iranian revolution is, is theocratic. So the Iranian revolution sees the world in kind of Manichaean terms and obviously appeals mostly to, to Shiites. So that's how Iran was able to become very popular in Lebanon. But Iran is very smart in the way it does things. It usually works with poorer people and it tries to sell itself as the quote unquote resistance. It doesn't sell itself as an Iranian empire uh, or an octopus taking over the region. No, no, it says, listen, we're just here to help. You know, you in, a, you in Lebanon, you have a problem? You, you don't like Israel? Okay, let's, we'll help you out. And in Iraq, you know, again, it's totally understandable why the heads of these groups joined with Iran in the 80s because they wanted to fight the Saddam regime. I mean, there's the same regime that, of course, Kurds and many other people were fighting. I think the problem is that you fast forward over time and this kind of mafia groups that Iran was working through, just like if you remember the beginning of The Godfather, there appears to be a reason that mafia exists in the sense that, like, well, it, it offers protection. But what happens, obviously, is, is that these groups become much more violent and then they become oppressive. So Iran works through these groups and they have armed militias or terrorist groups and they have political parties. And, you know, that's a real danger. Imagine if in any Western democracy you had not only a political party, but the political party had an armed wing that was equivalent to some sort of National Guard force. That's obviously unacceptable. So that's what Iran has done. And they've hijacked Iraq and they've put in place not just a miniature version of Hezbollah, but a miniature version of what they have in Iran, which is this IRGC or Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is basically the idea of a Praetorian Guard it is a religious guard that guards the regime. And I think what they've done is they've kind of hold out Iraq, as if you can imagine holding out a watermelon or something, and they've just filled it with these militias, the way you'd fill a watermelon with uh, with vodka or cheese or something. <laughs> I like that analogy. And so, Seth, would you say that the level of sophistication of Hezbollah is obviously not what we're necessarily seeing in Iraq, but we could see something like that in Iraq take shape? Well, I think that's an important question, is what, how is what's happening in Iraq different than what's happening in Lebanon? So, in Lebanon with Hezbollah, you have a group that has slowly but surely been able to kind of take over pieces of the Lebanese government and also create a kind of mini state with something like 150,000 rockets in which it's able to kind of have do everything, um, do all the functions of a government kind of as a parallel state, but also threaten other countries. And not only that, but obviously it was involved in fighting the Syrian civil war, so it has its own foreign policy. Now, I think in Iraq it's a bit different because what the what the Hajj al Shabi has accomplished, the pro Iranian militias, is that they've actually succeeded maybe more than Hezbollah in getting on the state payroll, so that they're an official paramilitary force. That allows them to have their own armories and their own weapons and things, and pretend that what they're doing is part of the state. It also creates a headache for them because if they attack people. Uh, and they use the weapons from their armories, then it would be directly linked to the Iraqi state. So that's why what you see is when they attack the Americans, they'll create some fake group with some fake name and claim that this random little fake group popped up last night and fired rockets, and then they don't have to take responsibility. So that's a kind of plausible liability. It's a very dirty business. And I think it's a, it's a complicated thing. I would I would say that what's happening in Iraq in some ways if it's worse than Lebanon, it's different than Lebanon because they really have, they really have the levers of the state. There's not even a, they're they're on track to kind of really hold the all of Iraq hostage and kind of control it. 
And that's not good, of course, for the Kurdish and Sunni and other communities. And it's also not good for young Shiites who have been protesting and who have been cracked down upon. It also speaks to the success that Iran has had in exporting the Islamic Revolution the last 40 years. They have sort of a workable business model that they can adapt to different locations depending on where they'd like to set up their next proxies. Um, so you made a good point about the differences between Iraq and Lebanon. They're not quite the same. Uh, but I do think it's interesting how adaptable Tehran is when it comes to uh, setting up shop in different parts of the Middle East. So I want to uh, place you know, these these series of attacks that we, we started off the interview with. I want to sort of place them as a puzzle piece in looking at Iranian escalation tactics as a whole in the last couple of months. Uh, you actually had a piece recently in the, in the Jerusalem Post where you discussed uh, Iran is also at least on state television, discussing the existence of this new missile city, quote unquote. Uh, it's located near the ocean, contains significant amount of missiles and munitions. Uh, you know, this is something that's been received to much fanfare. I guess my first question is, uh, how much do we trust this announcement? Well, I think that in the end of the day, we have to understand that Iran is a very, very smart, very sophisticated country. So. When it wants to put something on state TV and says, oh, look, we have all these cool missiles and look, it's an underground uh, <laughs> secret bunker. Uh, usually countries don't reveal the secret bunker. So, you know, you have to say, OK, this is a lot of this is messaging. Iran wants to tell the world it's got all these, these weapons. And then you could you could draw from that several conclusions. You could say that, well, they have they're showing off all these weapons and none of them work. And they're just showing this off because they want to show that they're really having cool indigenous capabilities and that's they're just showing off that despite sanctions the country's really strong well you could say that actually they all the weapons probably do work and they want to send a message to america that listen one day this is going to be in your backyard this could be used against israel or saudi arabia or the uae or against an american naval ship in the persian gulf so i think that's what's going on i think at the end of the day we have seen that iran carries out a lot of naval drills and they do use ballistic missiles, they do use drones, they do attempt to show that they have much higher levels of precision with their missile systems. And they have a lot of different types of missiles. I mean, Iran is, you know, one of the top, I don't know, five or six countries in the world in terms of ballistic missiles. I think after China, Russia, North Korea, basically, something like that. So, you know, and they've borrowed technology from those countries and they rely on it because Iran doesn't have a very strong navy. They don't have a strong conventional army, they don't have lots of tanks, they don't have much of an air force, but they do have a lot of missiles and a lot of drones. And they've shown that they can use those to effect uh, against the Saudis. They've used them themselves and they've armed the Houthis with them. They've armed Hamas, they've trained Hamas how to extend their rockets, and of course they've done the same with Hezbollah. And this actually ties into you know a, a concern you've expressed in the past about the lack of protection for tankers and cargo ships traveling in the Gulf of Oman. Uh, you know, that might be vulnerable to attacks by Iran. Do you foresee Tehran escalating its aggressive activities in the Gulf in the near future? Uh, you know, it's not just the United States that should be concerned. This is something that this is a concern that could potentially apply to a lot of our allies in the region, including Israel. I mean, we saw the the Helios Ray incident in February of this year. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear, you know, do you think that Tehran is going to be escalating its aggressive activities there in the near future. It does seem that there's a bit of a pattern with Iran, which is that not only do they like to escalate systematically a bit, but that they kind of play the region a bit like a piano. So you'll see that in January, February this year, whatever, they were escalating in Iraq, attacking American bases. And then all of a sudden, you know, the Houthis are increasing their attacks against Iraq, um, Saudi energy facilities in the last month. So they do seem to kind of, you know, one minute over here, and then all of a sudden, while you're looking over there, the other hand is moving it around the other direction, you know. So I right. would think that eventually we'll see them return to the Persian Gulf scenario, which is what we saw back in May, June 2019. They mined six ships, and then, you know, that, then it was quiet for a bit. Then there was the attack on Abcake in September 2019 using, like, 20 cruise missiles and drones. And then, as you mentioned, this Israeli-owned ship was attacked, and then... It's very interesting, after that ship was attacked, you may recall that the Wall Street Journal then came out with this article claiming that Israel had also attacked Iranian ships, which yep. I think maybe lead, changes our perception a bit because, you know, Iran can say, well, no, we were just... It was a response, yeah. 
And so who's mainly been responding to Iran? If it comes to deterrence or mitigating this type of aggression, what would be your recommendation? Well, that's a very, I think it's a very difficult question. I think it's one that has bedeviled different administrations because some administrations have decided to take the Iranian word for what it is and say, well, wait, if we just give them this some sort of deal or pay them off like a mafia, then, then they'll stop doing it. Or in other administrations, I guess like the Trump administration decided that, well, no, you know, we'll maybe we'll also be willing to strike back somehow. But even with the Trump administration, the, the red line was, don't kill any U.S. servicemen. And Iran read into that and understood that and then just attacked infrastructure and downed a drone. So, I mean, I think it's a very difficult question. You can, you can do a kind of tit-for-tat thing with Iran, which is every time they fired a missile, you could, attack, you could attack them. But usually with Iran, the problem is they use proxies or they mine ships and things, so it's very hard to get the evidence. And then that means if the U.S. administration or someone else were to attack Iran, they would be accused of starting a quote unquote war, even though Iran had started it itself. I think when you see the Israeli model in Syria is very interesting. Israel has carried out more than a thousand airstrikes, I guess more, probably more than 1,500 now on Iranian targets. They, Israel has said that. And I think that, you know, that show that's a huge shadow war. So if you say to yourself, well, look, Israel is able to strike at Iranian targets in Syria. Iran attacks, you know, uses the Houthis to attack Saudi Arabia. It's like this big regional war. And no one actually wants to fight an actual war between two states. They just like to do it in other people's countries. And that's the model. But I just I don't think the United U.S. public probably has a stomach for a real conflict with Iran. So perhaps the only thing to do would be to find ways to show off intelligence that directly links the Iranians to the attacks, like videos or, for instance, using better uh, you know, signals or intercepts to show off in Iraq, for instance, that these militias are involved. Uh, and then put out some sort of war, arrest warrants for them and maybe try to, you know, the Trump administration obviously just tried to assassinate a few of them, but the U.S. could try to go after them that way. Um, I think in the, other, in the past, the U.S. has also used sanctions and other things to try to cut off money to Iran and try to cut off certain aspects of the weapons programs and things like that. The United States could certainly do more in terms of showing how the Houthis in, in Yemen are able to produce all these drones and propulsion systems for missiles and help maybe help the Saudis do with targeting, but then the U.S. has said openly now it doesn't want to help with offensive uh, offensive attacks. So the only thing it could say is, well, we're going to help you with more precision attacks, so you don't end up killing any civilians. We'll just help you show where the where the propulsion systems are being made or something like that. But I think it's a very complicated issue, and as you probably know, the Saudis and other countries in the region also don't have a stomach for a large war with Iran. They also don't mind to fight the war in someone else's country. What also limits the costs that are incurred if, if you're able to, to export the conflict elsewhere. And I'm curious, too, what the diplomatic implications of, say, you know, the Iran nuclear deal 2.0 might have on deterrence capabilities in the United States, right? Because on one hand, we're trying to deter Iran, but on the other hand, we're trying to drag them to the negotiating table. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, um, you know, how you reckon all these escalation tactics might impact negotiations vis-a-vis -vis the JCPOA 2.0? Well, the whole question of the Iran deal is, is, is a strange unto itself because this question of why does, why does the Western world have to be in a situation of always begging the Iran to do what, some sort of weird deal when Iran itself says it doesn't even want nuclear weapons? So why does it need to have a deal in the first place? Why does it need to get under this strange thing in which it also then links the deal to attacks all over the region as if like, well, if you don't if you don't do some sort of weird mafia like deal with us, then we get to attack you wherever you are. The whole the whole nature of the deal and the use of attacks in other countries to get to it uh, just shows the way Iran is sort of a criminal regime. No other country in the world does this. No other country says, "Well, you need to do some like weird deal with us, otherwise we'll we'll mobilize a bunch of proxies and militias in other countries to attack random people." I mean, the whole thing is strange. I, I think it's I think the whole nature of the deal is strange. The whole question of well. If you don't do this deal, then all of it, then you have to go to war with Iran. You don't have to go to war with Iran. Iran's not supposed to build a nuclear weapon. That should be a clear red line. And I think it's unclear then how a deal is even entered into again, because Iran has basically signaled that it doesn't really accept the United States as a as a country that can go back to what it what Iran says it's already broken all the, the agreements anyway. And Iran has also broken most of its agreements in terms of enrichment. So the whole thing seems to be a bit of a catch twenty two. It also goes back to the, I think, the false paradigm that was peddled in 2015, 2014, and the, the years leading up to the Iran deal uh, was that there are only two binaries that could, that, or there's no, excuse me, there was only uh, 
um, the binary of war or negotiate or you know negotiations with Iran. There was no in between. Uh, if we didn't negotiate with Iran, we were going to have full blown war, uh, and that's been the binary we've seen with uh, most maneuvers that were made in the Middle East uh, under the Trump administration. That was the biggest critique that we saw coming from the national security community that every single move was going to cause World War III, whether it was moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem or the targeted strike against Qasem Soleimani. Uh, we were told time and time again that this was going to lead to war. And so I think it's really interesting now because the United States is in a weird spot uh, that you, you hit the nail on the head. It's sort of awkward to, to have to negotiate with a mafia-like regime. Uh, but I guess I want, I want to pivot now because, you know, thank you again for providing your insight on Iranian escalation tactics. We could we could probably talk for another hour about it. But I wanted to give a chance, give you a chance to kind of tell us more about your book uh, titled Drone Wars. It's slated to be released this coming June. Um, I did have the privilege to read it, so I, I'm really happy that you're able to come on and speak with us about it. You know, I wanted to ask you, first and foremost, why drones in particular and what makes them so special? You, you discuss in your book a new world order that we're facing. Could you unpack that a little bit more for us? Sure, definitely. Look, drones are, are fascinating just unto themselves because you have these vehicles that are these flying machines that are kind of very futuristic. And I think anyone who grew up, maybe my generation remembers the movies like Terminator, some of these futuristic movies. I mean, the idea of all these machines flying around was something that was, you know, scary, but also really cool and very futuristic. It's, it's different than the kind of hokey thing that we saw maybe the, uh, before my generation, which was like, you know, flying cars and space colonies and all this nonsense, which never was going to happen. But the, the drones are a real thing and they really have happened. They really have been happening for a long time now, decades. But what's fascinating to me is that, you know, if you go back to after 9-11, one of the big symbols of the U.S. war on terror was this: the predators, the, the drones that were being used to, to kill uh, terrorists and sometimes mistakenly to kill civilians. And I think for 10 years or so, you know, there was a lot of debate, only mostly in America, about whether the ethics of the drones and whether drones are good or bad and what about the, the operators and PTSD and this and that. And I think what's fascinating about the last five or 10 years, and I witnessed a lot, some of it myself, um, in Iraq or in, you know, covering the wars Israel's fought in other places. The degree to which drones are now everywhere in the kind of modern battlefield, it's not just an American thing. It's not, uh, it's something that Turkey's making drones, China's making drones, Israel's using drones, and people are also using them as a handheld thing. You know, terrorists are able to buy drones off the shelf and equip them with grenades and things like that. ISIS has done that. And countries that work with terrorist groups, countries like Iran, are able to outfit them with pretty sophisticated uh, drones that are a bit, a bit like a cross between a kind of cruise missile and a German um, or two V1 rocket. But they're pretty scary because what drones allow you to do is have this like instant air force. If you're a relatively small, even relatively poor country or even a terrorist group, you can just buy a bunch of these things or get some aid to build them. And you can have an instant air force against another country. And all of a sudden, it's pretty difficult for that country to stop this threat without investing billions of dollars in lots of weapon systems and air defense. And it's a it's a big, uh, huge hole. And I think that we're going to see, and as I talked in the book, we're going to see an explosion of these weapons all over the world. And the idea that this was a kind of, what's the word, a kind of um, old boys club in which America and a few Western countries were using them, that's just no longer the case. And this might be a strange analogy, but you, you had a, a discussion of how easy it is, at least in your book, how easy it is for terrorist groups and other non-state actors to develop their own drone technology. And it made me think of, you know, the, the, the lowering of the barriers to entry. So like the economic example of how, you know, new companies enter the market, what you kind of said that it's the collapse of the old boys club, uh, the accessibility of drone technology. Uh, the ability to adapt it to fit a variety of needs beyond just surveillance makes it extremely problematic. And it also seems like it's tough to contain as well. Uh, and I'd be curious if you might be willing to discuss sort of how the uses or purposes of drones have changed over time. So obviously, we it started at as they started at least as simply surveillance mechanisms. Uh, but it seems like they're taking on additional capabilities. Um, they're also taking on uh, 
more artificial intelligence dynamics as well, which you talk about in your book is sort of the quote unquote doomsday scenario. So what type of capabilities might we expect from drones in the coming future beyond what they're currently capable of doing now? That's a great question. Um, it's very interesting we think about, you know, you touched on the kind of how is this a game changer? Throughout the history of warfare, there's been all sorts of times when all of a sudden some new weapon system appears and changes the whole face of war, whether it's the invention of firearms or the invention of a tank. I mean, look at how tanks began as these huge lumbering beasts in the First World War. By the time of the Second World War, you know, they were just transforming the battlefield and, and able to allow the Germans, for instance, to conquer, you know, half of Europe or something. So it's drones are, are a machine that's like that. They're, they're, not, they're a platform, but they're also, as you mentioned, a kind of tactical and strategic element. And I think the big question is right. How does this machine, which is basically a machine, how does it, how does it enter into the system? So, for instance, look at the history of air warfare in general, like airplanes, right? You had in the First World War, you had planes where guys were chucking bombs out of these biplanes or whatever, which isn't very uh, precise, right? And then you had strategic bombing. The Americans just flattened uh, parts of Japan or Germany, right, using strategic bombing. And then you have, you know, precision air warfare and things like the F-35, these like data sponges. So, you know, with drones, I think that's what we're, we have to we'll look at next, which is that not only can you have these precision strikes or kind of wide area surveillance, but you have a kind of menagerie or different layers of drones and they all have different capabilities. So, for instance, every squad or every platoon, if you've ever, if you've ever seen a platoon in a military movie, if you've served in the army, a platoon has different people with different specialties, right? It has someone that knows how to use the mortars or someone who uses a, maybe a sniper or whatever, uh, someone who, who does different skills. So you'd have someone with a skill set, which is the drone operator, or maybe two of them. And the drone operator would be able to do a, use, have a surveillance drone with a tablet in his hand or her hand. And the person would also have two or three drones in their back pocket or in their backpack, what are called like man packable drones, one of which would be like a, what's called a kamikaze or loitering munition drone, which is actually a drone that's actually a missile. So it goes up in the air, and when it sees the enemy, you just push a button and it flies right into that person. Now, the using artificial intelligence and automatic target recognition, uh, the drone is looking over the field of battle. Let's say I'm in a house and, I'm, and there's an enemy in the next house over, but I can't get to that person because I can't get around the corner without being shot at. I chuck my drone out the window, it goes over around the corner, it looks down and it uses artificial intelligence and algorithms to identify an enemy. But what's smart about the algorithm is that it identifies a, a, a weapon in the hand of an enemy, like an AK-47, based on patterns. So it doesn't identify you know, a child or something as an enemy threat. And I've, I've actually been on a, a, a kind of drill where they showed how that works. The drones can scan a house. In fact, it's not always a, dr a drone that flies, it could be a robotic dog. It scans every room and it knows what an AK-47 looks like. So it knows to identify a handgun as opposed to a spatula, right? And, you know, you, with the kind of electro optics and all the stuff we have now, it can do all that. The question is, how do you incorporate that into every platoon? How do you make soldiers who are trained to carry rifles feel comfortable playing with gadgets? And, you know, in the end of the day, I mean, we've seen that happen a lot in the, you know, I think, the armed forces, you know, the fact that pilots were trained to fly planes and then were being asked to fly drones, I think, probably annoyed some of them. So it means, you know, changing the whole nature of what it means to be a warfighter, a warrior. And I'm sure that's a that's going to be an issue that armies are going through. But as we saw in recent conflicts, whether it's Israel or Azerbaijan or other places where drones are, are transforming warfare, uh, these machines can do a lot of damage and they can make a lot of systems totally obsolete. They can do what the United States did to Saddam's army in 1991 when a massive uh, Soviet-style, massive conventional army was totally destroyed uh, in 30 days. And drones can play a role in that. And so this seems like it would change not just the nature of how we attack, but also in terms of how soldiers prepare for war. And you discuss a little bit in your book about the quote-unquote video game mentality. This is the type of accusation that is lodged when it comes to drone usage. Um, but it, I, I thought you had an interesting passage where you reference how, in some ways, drone usage can can take a larger toll uh, on those who have to, empl um, you know, employ them. What do, could you explain that a little bit more or unpack that? Because I thought that was very interesting and I hadn't seen that argument made. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think the otherworldly nature of these machines, especially the way in which the United States conducted its war was, you know, that you had people going in to a kind of trailer or, or a base or something, 
And they would basically look at a computer screen all day with one person doing some of the flying, one person as a weapons service officer or, or what have you. Uh, you know, and they'd use a joystick or whatever or push a button. They could watch graphically the people being killed. They could watch the people running away and then see another strike come in and kill them as well. Now, even though the, even though the people they're killing might be terrorists or bad guys, um, I think that it, it certainly did seem to take a toll. And from what we've seen in movies or the interviews I did, I mean, you know, people talked about how they'd leave the trailer or whatever, and then you go back to your normal life, <laughs> dressed like a civilian, you know, go home or go to a bar or something. And you can't tell anyone, by the way, what did you do today? Uh, well, I drove a truck to, you know, I drove a taxi. But what did you do? Well, I killed three people on a computer screen. Um, but it looks a lot like Counter-Strike when I was playing. <laughs> I think, you know, no, that's very difficult. And the, the, well, I think what one person said was like, you know what, if I was in a real, if I was actually in the combat zone, I mean, anyone who's covered war knows what it's like, the psychology of going into a combat zone and, and being in a place of war, which is totally different. And of course you come home and you may have PTSD and other things as well, but you, you transition back to civilian life. There's a process that takes place. And with the, I think with the drone operators, I guess, the sense I heard a bit was that there wasn't that ability to process some of that. Although I don't know if that's the case in every country. I'm sure different countries do things differently. So there may be many cases where the operators are not going, going back to a civilian setting. Maybe they are just deployed out in the field. And then it would, they might not have that jarring uh, aspect. And this leads to my next question then, because you know, I want to ask you more about the ethics of drone usage, right? So there's both the moral and the legal component component of when it comes to drone usage. Uh, and this would seem to touch upon sort of the moral implications of drone usage. But I am really curious, um, you know, it seems to me that there was, there's been a decent amount of pushback, although not really successfully, but a decent amount of pushback against the legal usage of drones. Is that, would you say that's a fair estimation? I think there's been pushback primarily because it was an American program and there was a lot of you know, America's a big, transparent country, and it's a democracy, so there was a lot of self-criticism. Um, but I don't think that – I've seen what I've seen now is that as countries like Turkey or other countries are using drones, it seems to me there's a lot less criticism. And I think that's because the world has fundamentally shifted. The idea that drones in and of themselves are controversial, I think, is no, is not doesn't exist as much anymore. And I think at the end of the day, a drone firing a Hellfire missile or a Turkish drone or Bayraktar or whatever, firing whatever its type of missile is – um, you know, that's just a missile. How is that different than an F-16 firing missile? So someone guides it in. So someone guides in other missiles. People guide in cruise missiles. I mean, how is that different than the footage we saw in the in the Gulf War or what have you? I just think that there was a, a real sense of criticism, especially the Obama administration, because the administration was supposed to be progressive, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there was a lot of questions. Why are you fighting these shadow wars in Africa and Yemen and Pakistan? Why are drones circling over some poor Pakistani village where the person there doesn't get to have any say in this. And look, I've been in the in, in frontline areas where I've listened to drones humming and buzzing all day for days on end. And I could understand how you'd be a little bit annoyed if you're a civilian who has to live under this. And I, I understand that. So I think the issue is it wasn't, it was more about criticizing the United States and it was the United States deserves criticism when it does the wrong thing. But I think now we're at a point where, you know, is anyone criticizing China or all these other countries for building drones? I haven't heard as much criticism. I think there's also sometimes a double standard as well. Um, I think that this is probably true for Israel as well. I, I would say I know it's true for Israel. You know, the United States and Israel are held to different standards at times, I think, than uh, peer states might be held to. And so that's a that's a constant wrestling match, I think, within the arena of weaponry and warfare in general. But I would I would want to ask you, too, do you think that there is a, you know, a reasonable argument to be made that drone usage in some ways can be more ethical in the sense that it allows for targeted killings to actually mitigate the incidents of civilian deaths. So this is a common refrain I see when it comes to discussion of drone usage and how, especially in civilian areas, like you said, it's it can tell, some drones can maybe able to tell a difference between a spatula and an AK-47, um, but it, they're also incredibly precise. And so that that could be a boon in some ways because it will, it, it may help to mitigate instances of civilian death. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I was just doing an interview with an expert from Israel's Rafael Advanced Defense Systems about what would the Gulf War look like today if it had if it was fought again. Uh, we were talking more about you know just air power in general, not not necessarily drones. But 
you know, through the conversation, one thing that really struck me was, you know what, if you had to fight the Gulf War style war again, you could be a lot more precise. And there were incidences in that war, not only where, you know, probably lots of soldiers were killed unnecessarily, I mean, Iraqi soldiers mostly, but also civilians. This Ferdos bunker that was hit, um, you know, I think hundreds of people were killed in one airstrike, and that's awful. And I think that, yes, precision allows you to be a lot more sure about what's going on in that bunker. Who, who, For instance, a drone could be hovering over that same place for days on end. It would photograph everything. There'd be no question. It wouldn't be that the satellite makes a pass every 24 hours. It's like, no, no, no. We know everything that went on, went on and we've had the algorithms and the AI. We can, can go back so a human doesn't have to look over every second of this. But the AI can tell you, you know, 300 people went in, two came out, and these people, none of them were carrying firearms. Um, and all the people went back to places that looked like civilian homes. They didn't all go back to, a, you know, a Baghdad central headquarters. And those types of patterns can be traced. Now, the problem is there is a question is what happens when the computer makes a mistake and the man in the loop or the person who's supposed to push the button uh, is fed the wrong information. So I think there's a, it's a lot about parameters. But electro optics and the abilities to scan much lower down allow you to not just see blobs running in and out of that bunker. But, you know, I can see, yeah, wait, 70 percent of the people going in are women. And the signature of this is that these are probably not, you know, Taliban. <laughs> these are probably civilians. So I think that. That's an important change. Now, war can be a lot more precise. Look at the Israeli strikes in Syria. There's been basically no civilian casualties in a thousand airstrikes. That's unprecedented. It's unheard of in military history to carry out thousands of airstrikes and have zero, basically zero civilian casualties. So that shows what modern warfare can be like. On the other side of the coin, when Azerbaijan used drones against the Armenians last, um, last year in the war, if, for instance, drone strikes do kill civilians, then you can pretty much be sure that the operator knew that and that he or she chose to kill them. So it also puts a lot more onus in the operator because if you have like 100% precision and you can get down to the square inch, well, then if you kill a civilian, you're definitely at fault in the war crimes trial. So you can't say, oh, whoops, I dropped a dumb bomb on a building and I just didn't know who was in it. So it takes out the whoops factor as well. So that's a big change. I think that's a big change we could think of in, in this in scenario as well. So in some ways that might, you know, help to mitigate some of the more controversial discussions around drones, but I do find it fascinating, the idea, I hadn't thought of this before, the idea that uh, with drone drone usage and especially against, potentially against civilians, it's much easier to be able to say, you did this purposefully and you did this intentionally. It wasn't just a mistake. It wasn't, uh, you know, one of the negative externalities of, you know, going after military targets. It was it was precise and it was intentional. Um, well, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Seth, for your time. This was a fascinating conversation. And I learned a lot about drones from your book. I'm very excited that you wrote something like this. It really is a tour de force. I recommend anyone who's listening now um, to do check out Seth's book. It should be getting published close to the end of June. Is that right, Seth? Um, yes, it is. If you just and if you just look up my name and drone wars on uh, I guess Amazon or Simon Schuster, you, you should be able to find it. I mean, there's only one Franceman out there who's written a book called Drone Wars. Yeah, no, it, it was it was excellent. And uh, like I said, it, it really goes through a lot of not just the ethical implications of drone usage, but also historically speaking, where they started and where we might anticipate the usage to be in the future. So thank you again for your time. I really appreciate this conversation. And we well, would definitely love to have you back on. Thank you. And now for the latest NATSEC updates from the Jensen News Desk. Bahrain and Israel have announced the first ambassador from Manama to Israel. His name is Khalid Yusuf Al-Jalama. Israeli Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi stated, quote, The decision of the Bahraini government to appoint an ambassador to Israel is another important step in the implementation of the peace agreement between and of the strengthening of ties between the two countries, end quote. A Bahraini team is expected to arrive in Israel soon to establish the delegation, that the final location of the embassy has not yet been revealed. Meanwhile, state-run media in Iran announced that Tehran would not be accepting some sanctions relief from the Biden administration in return for halting its 20% uranium enrichment activity. According to state-run Press TV's website, quote, a senior Iranian official tells Press TV that Tehran will stop its 20% uranium enrichment only if the U.S. lifts all its sanctions on Iran first, end quote. <laughs> 
According to Press TV's website, quote, a senior Iranian official tells Press TV that Tehran will stop its 20% uranium enrichment only if the U.S. lifts all its sanctions on Iran first, end quote. According to reporting in Politico earlier this week, the Biden administration had planned to make some concessions to Iran in exchange for the regime halting its work on advanced centrifuges and halt its 20% uranium enrichment activity. And in other news, Manwar Barghouti, a Palestinian prisoner convicted of terrorism by an Israeli court, has announced his decision to run an independent list in the upcoming Palestinian elections. His announcement has been met with considerable attention, given the jailed Palestinian leader poses a real threat to the current Palestinian president and leader of the Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas, who, polling suggests, might lose to Barghouti should the two face off. Barghouti is a former member of the Fatah and has launched independent runs in the past, but he has always landed back in the Fatah. The Palestinian presidential elections are slated to take place on July 31st. And finally, the Houthis in Yemen, with the backing of Iran, have continued their ravage of the country, this time by infiltrating Yemen's education system. According to a recent report by the Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance in School Education, the Iranian curriculum promoted by the Houthis emphasizes to Yemeni children the necessity of, quote, uniting Muslims against Western enemies, end quote. Some textbooks refer to the United States as the, quote, greater Satan, end quote, and openly advocate for Israel's destruction, referring to the Jewish state as a, quote, cancerous growth. The Houthi slogan, quote, Allah is the greatest, death to America, death to Israel, curse on the Jews, victory to Islam, end quote, appears throughout Houthi design textbooks. Arithmetic problems involve adding rifles. Graphic and violent imagery is used throughout. The National Security Digest is brought to you by JINSA, the Jewish Institute for National Security of America, at JINSA.org. We're a think tank dedicated to educating national security decision makers on American defense and strategic interests, with an emphasis on the Middle East and the U.S.-Israeli alliance. I invite you to follow us on Twitter at JINSA DC. That's J-I-N-S-A-D-C. And while you're at it, feel free to follow me, Ariel Davidson, on Twitter at Political L. That's at Political E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. I am a senior policy analyst at JINSA. Twice each month, we're going to be bringing on a wide variety of guests who specialize in national security issues relating to the broader Middle East. Please subscribe to us from wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to speaking with you again on the next episode of the National Security Digest.